Welcome to Slash Forward. In this episode, we're going to explore man's hubris via the Roger Corman produced environmentalist cautionary tale, Piranha. When a couple of youngsters go missing in the wilderness of the Pacific Northwest, Maggie is hired to try to track down their whereabouts. But with a vast wilderness in front of her, she's forced to rely on the expertise of local bushman, Paul Grogan, a true American badass. As they get closer and closer to discovering the truth, they run into more and more resistance from the local military outpost to keep the potential environmental fallout under wraps. However, with a waterborne menace making its way downriver and potentially emptying into the ocean, the unlikely pair find themselves in a race to warn and save as many people as possible from the terrifying and painful natural process of being converted into fish poop. Aside from the environmental aspects, this movie also speaks strongly to the value in ensuring governmental leaders divest themselves of private business interests. Feel free to chew on that topic and discuss it in the comments below. And while you're here, check out some of my other videos. This one would pair nicely with The Prophecy or The Host, a duo of water monster based films with environmental undertones. Let's get to it. We open on a quaint and serene wilderness where Barb and David make their way through the foliage, looking for a prime spot to bed down for the night. They arrive at a sign of warning that they treat as an encouragement, as it clearly indicates that something cool lies yonder. Sure enough, they find some far out industrial ruins, and despite the almost assured presence of tetanus, they elect to bathe in the silty waters, which is sexy AF. After diving in, Dave immediately feels a couple of stingy little nibbles that become too distracting to continue swimming, and soon he's dragged below the blood red water. And then, as the moon passes behind some clouds, we learn that ignoring warning signs is not groovy. Not groovy at all. We then transition to the plane station where Maggie's enjoying the video arcade as her final rental car arrangements are made. As she's seen off, we learn that she's heading to Indian Springs and that she's been hired to find something. But we don't need to know what quite yet. Then we move on to Big Paul Grogan, receiving his delivery of party materials from Jack. The cost? However much he can peel off before Jack says stop. You see, old Jack doesn't need much in this life, and what he does need is provided by the Great River. She bathes him, nourishes him with her fish, swaddles him in her watery bosom, and even rocks him to sleep at night. Yep, yeah, Jack's living a life of simple contentment. We then catch up with Maggie in a jeep that there's no way she rented from Hertz. After some engine trouble, she finds herself at the doorstep of rustic Paul Grogan. Despite the lack of invitation, she immediately notifies him that she's a skip tracer and has traveled up to his hovel to look for some missing teens. But Paul's used to being alone, other than his daughter, and he's not much for conversation. He points her in the direction of Jack's cabin, or the old abandoned military facility upriver. Being a woodland noob, she insists he show her the way. Her tenacity is unassailable, which is demonstrated further as she gains entry to the facility. After a bit of searching and cold calling, they eventually arrive at the pool. She finds a locket with Barb's initials. Convinced they're resting at the bottom of the pool, they look for a way to drain it. They're surprised to find some warm coffee in this old abandoned post. Upon entering the lab, it becomes apparent there is still some testing going on, and some of the subjects have earned the privilege to roam free. But all this Dr. Moreau shit creeps Paul out, and he is eager to leave. On the way, Maggie finds even more evidence that the couple had been there, and likely still are. Paul balks at the thought of draining the water sans permission, and his concerns are confirmed when Dr. Hope shows up and starts to choke a bitch. Luckily, an alarm goes off, taking his attention and allowing Paul to deliver a firm hammer fist to the shoulder, inciting a swoon. As Paul cools his mostly unused knuckles, he gives them a customary lick and realizes the water is salty. So good thing they drained it without any preparation. They do find some bones, but presume them to be the remains of a dog, and then here is Dr. Hoke takes off in their wheels. But he's still woozy from that shoulder injury and he flips that sucker. And despite all this head trauma, they do find him alive. He wakes up later, lashed to a table, and insists they've unleashed a pox upon the local wildlife. However, he declines to elaborate further before bedtime. The unlikely pair try to puzzle out what's going on, and in sharing some personal details, we learn that Paul's daughter is away at camp across the lake. The next morning, they confront the complexities of getting their captive to the police without a vehicle. They opt to travel to the dam, which always has a ranger on duty. Because Paul wasn't joking about his commitment to primitive living, they're forced to travel via river raft. We then transition to Paul's daughter, little Susie, as a counselor tries to work out how to convince her to overcome her fears of the water. She's irrationally afraid of there being something in the water. Mr. Dumont doesn't have time for coddling, though. People eat fish, Grogan. 
fish don't eat people. Because there is an upcoming water competition, he's pushing for peak performance. We then check in with Jack, doing some drinking and some storytelling, which he barely concludes before getting mobbed by a gang of things. Elsewhere, Dr. Hope wakes up on the raft and insists they stay away from the water, for it's filled with piranha. Oh, it's piranha. And for no reason in particular, they choose not to believe him. He did suffer a multitude of recent head injuries, but then they float by old Jack's place. After securing the raft, they stumble upon Jack. We never learn how they manage their grief, because Paul immediately transitions to digging a shallow grave for his old friend, which seems hasty. At camp, another counselor works to find a way to help Susie get out of the swimming race. She ultimately settles on adorning her with a fake contusion to the knee. Meanwhile, to pad out the body count, Paul reaches in to free a net and we observe a little nibble turn into a full-on frothing frenzy as the relentless school collects their meal. Back with the main crew, Hoke reveals that he was involved in genetically modifying the fish to make them adaptable and quick to breed, so they could be used as a biological weapon in the Vietnam War. When the war ended, the military poisoned the water, but Hoke did too damn good a job, and some of the stronger ones survived and proliferated. The story jogs loose something in Paul's memory, and he suddenly realizes that every so often, they open the dam a little to even out the lake. So catastrophe is imminent. As they continue on, we learn that Hoke really has a hang-up with the thought they may hold him responsible for this fiasco. And then they run across our friend little Joshua, calling out for daddy and hoping not to sink. Eager for his redemption arc, Hoke leaps into the water and swims at a snail's pace so as to ensure Joshua's safe passage to the raft before sinking. He also ensures that Joshua gets a good full view of death before the day is done. They manage to pull him aboard, but he's really messed up now. Continuing further along, they come to regret declining a burial at sea, as transporting a bloody corpse only attracts and frenzies the predators, who begin to loosen the lashes as they attempt to feed. They jettison the corpse and consolidate the raft, aiming for shore before it falls apart and just barely making it. Paul then breaks into an all-out sprint toward the dam as the air horn sounds, signaling a gratifying release impending. Luckily for Paul, the ranger is fairly inept, allowing him to make it just in time. Upon notification, the military rolls up with their specialty meat bait division. The meat boys quickly find strong evidence of piranha activity. Easy solve, it's just a matter of overwhelming the river with poison. Colonel Waxman offers the civilians a job to try to keep them quiet, as the grunts work to fill the river with a couple of garden hoses? But Paul knows this river like he knows the nooks and crannies of his own body, and he believes there's an alternate route to the lake. Dr. Mengers is not concerned about this because of how stupid fish are, and this is despite her familiarity with Dr. Hoke's good work. In light of Paul's continued protestations, they learn that their retention that evening will not be voluntary. That night, Paul resolves to leave post-haste, and sends Maggie out to employ her feminine wiles on the guard, which consists of exposing her Taz so they can acquire a jeep and roll out. Paul makes a courtesy call to Mr. Dumont to warn of the danger heading their way. He doesn't believe a word of it, but judging by the late hour, they have plenty of time to get there. Unfortunately, they zoom too greatly and get pulled over in their stolen vehicle. They hope to convince the officer of what's going down, but he pulls a dang gun on him. He circles back with the colonel, who confirms the need to hold them and prevent them from communicating with the outside world. You know, justice. So Officer Hickey tells them to cool out for the night, and he leaves for his patrol. As we find out, the colonel has a vested interest in keeping a lid on this thing, because he happens to be the silent partner in a business venture poised for a grand opening the next day. Back at camp, the counselors discuss how nice it would be to get in a night swim. You know, just feel free in the water as it laps up your body. But Mr. Dumont ruins the mood with his general presence and disdain for off-hours entertainment. At the holding cell, Maggie opts to mimic an escape routine she learned from an old salt she put in jail a couple of times. She makes it work and acquires the keys so they can leave in yet another stolen government vehicle. Before you know it, it's the next afternoon and the grand opening of the new business pavilion. The festivities wind up and they hope to wrangle in some business by giving everyone a bunch of free swag. As the celebration of commercialism unfolds, the kids line up for their water games. The little blood-filled meat sacks all go hopping into the water while Mr. Dumont prepares to officiate the biggest competition of his life. Susie uses the commotion to slip away and hide under a canoe. Knowing his daughter's well-being is in jeopardy, Paul drives it like he stole it and recklessly flies down the road like a cannonball. The games do get underway, and the kids frolic about as Mr. Dumont screams his lungs out while brandishing a gun. You know, camp stuff. 
Shortly thereafter, the bites begin. You thought they wouldn't do it, but sure enough, the kids are getting gnawed up, lending credence to Susie's irrational fear of the water, which has to be encouraging for her. Of course, now is also when she decides to grab a soft-bottomed raft and venture in to rescue her two favorite counselors. However, her plan only ends up working for one of them. Paul and Maggie arrive just in time to observe the bloody aftermath. Maggie calls the new Aquarina to let them know of the potential danger that's about to be actualized, but no dice. They just can't make the business case for closing down on grand opening day, so Paul shames Mr. Dumont before heading that way. Despite being a complete stranger to her, Maggie gives Susie a little shoulder squeeze and then tags along. They race there in a similar fashion to before, with various beach shenanigans in full swing. The three business partners conspire to continue to cover up, completely unwilling to accept the potential risk. But we know what's coming, and the first victims are a trio of scuba divers checking out the various river weeds growing down below. The aftermath is witnessed by a hot shot monoskier, whose cries to go in are unheeded by these rambunctious ladies, who refuse to stop until he proves his worth to them. But then they do stop, but he insists they get going again causing enough confusion to result in a mid-river catastrophe. The swarm then moves in on the swimmers, who begin going down left and right, as the already murky waters become filled with chum. Of course, this begins right as Buck Gardner was on the horn with the local papers, telling them the rumors of water danger are completely unfounded. The patrons rush to get out, but it's really quite a nibblerific bloodbath out there, with people losing little bits of themselves all over. They continue to run overland, despite their relative safety from fish, and amidst the bedlam, the colonel gets his comeuppance. Paul and Maggie arrive just in time to save no one, and go joyriding in someone's speedboat, hoping to head off the swarm at a bottleneck where they can smother them in pollution. Paul has to open the floodgate manually, so he ropes up and gives instructions to count to 100 before tugging him out. Once it gets past that time, he's pretty much dead, regardless of whether the piranha get him or not. He makes his way into the underwater office and reaches the wheel just in time. Those little suckers get to picking at him, but he focuses in good and hard, and opens the pipes right as Maggie hits 100. She then jet boats his lily white ass straight out of there, leaving the piranha behind to choke on it. Back at the resort, the courtyard looks like a medic's tent from World War II, except there are children lying about as well. Susie faithfully delivers her old pop some of his daddy juice to revive him, while Dr. Mengers gets back on her bullshit, proclaiming there's no way the swarm could have survived the blast of pollution or reached the ocean. But the end title implies otherwise. Originally created to suckle off that Jaws clout, Piranha actually ended up being a reasonably well done movie. Movie. It has a nice mixture of humor elements and was conservative enough in its effects that Joe Dante, who eventually went on to direct Gremlins, didn't have to skimp out on the scenes of destruction, which were plentiful and expansive. They originally intended to have Rick Baker do the effects, but he recommended they get in touch with Rob Bottin, who eventually went on to do the effects work for John Carpenter's The Thing. Basically, the movie borrows a strong premise from a huge blockbuster, and then is put together by a group of first-timers who would eventually go on to create massive hits. So despite any underlying issues or weaknesses, the movie can't help but to entertain and be of a generally higher quality than it really has any right to be. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks uncensored movie reviews of Life Force, Under the Skin, and Possessor, with others to be added over time. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.